Okay, good morning, good afternoon, everyone from around the world. Um, welcome to this panel on um, election administration. We have a fantastic group of papers that are looking at a variety of uh, issues and countries around the world. Um, so uh, just a few, a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, as uh, Maddie just informed me and, and Toby, what we're gonna be doing is we will be recording the presentations uh, and later possibly to upload these um, uh, online if the presenters agree, but we will not be recording the Q&A. So if you, you know, once we get to the Q&A, if you have a question, you, you won't be recorded. All right, so we have five papers on this panel. So what we're gonna try to do is really stick to 12 minutes per paper, um, followed by um, a discussion from Angus Bridgman, who uh, has agreed to um, keep the discussion to a maximum 15 minutes. So he'll discuss all papers, uh, 15, max 15 minutes. And then we should have, we really hope to have at least 15 minutes, maybe even more ideally, for some discussion and questions from the audience at the end of the panel. So what I'm gonna do for the panelists, um, if it's okay with you at about the to, so I'm going to ask the panelists to stick to 12 minutes, and when you have two minutes left, I'm just going to cut in with voice, if that's okay with you all, and just let you know you have two minutes left, okay? Um, without further ado, we can get started. Uh, our first presenter is Alistair Clark from Newcastle University, who will be presenting on public funding of election administration. So Alistair, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and uh, share the screen. There we are. Hopefully everyone can see that. Everyone got it? Yes, we can see that. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, here we go. Um, what I'm going to do in this this talk is, is talk about something that's that, that's very difficult to find data on, um, and that is the, the public funding of election administration, and and interrogate this through the, the lens of um, equality and, and inequality. Um, electoral equality is one of these things which is underpins much of the electoral process. Um, basically, everyone's electoral rights should be equal. Um, Article 21.3 of the UNDHR, for instance, is universal and equal suffrage held by secret votes. The weight of the vote should be equal and so on and so forth. So equality very much underpins um, what we're interested in and the integrity of the, the electoral systems. Um, but as I don't need to explain to this audience, um, there are numerous inequalities in electoral processes. Turnout, um, registration, electoral systems, restrictive processes, all of those kinds of things um, actually show some degree of, of inequalities, both in inputs and potentially in, in outputs as well. Um, how can this be mitigated? My argument in the paper that, <coughs> that I've circulated is that that ultimately institutional structures are one of the, the key aspects of, in, to try and mitigate this. And, and particularly the field of election administration. The field of electoral administration is the, the kind of key linkage institution between the public and the, the electoral process, well, basically translating their democratic rights into electoral outcomes. Ultimately, however, electoral administration needs capacity to work and to function properly. Um, and of course, we all know about the complexity of the, the electoral cycle, um, but there are periodic tasks, much of these which don't get much um, public attention because they happen out with the immediate election period, but which the exercise of democratic rights depends very closely on. All of this ultimately um, needs capacity for electoral administrators to, to run and um, for voters to have their, their electoral rights 
um, guaranteed. Ultimately, however, that capacity is derived from, from money. Um, this will come as no surprise to public policy scholars. If public policies are not correctly funded or properly funded, then the, the policy is likely to, to at least be problematic, potentially could fail and, and what have you. This is the same in electoral administration. Um, if the electoral administration is not properly funded, then <coughs> excuse me, voters have difficulties in exercising their, their democratic right. What we do know from the little that's, that's known about um, <coughs> funding of electoral administration is that there can be variation in funding um, the, the electoral process. <coughs> different, different types of systems, <coughs> different types of electoral administration ultimately spend more or less depending on the, the demands on them. And although that's referring to kind of country analysis for which see the, the IFAS um, UNDP report from 2005, you get a real sense for that variation between countries. That variation is also evident within countries as well. Um, the work of the likes of Robert Montjoy and uh, Toby's written on this um, as well one or two others, um, very clearly show that there can be variation in funding electoral administration, not just at the country level, but within the country as well. Ultimately, this can have partisan consequences and can actually go to, to reinforce pre-existing inequalities. The argument in the literature, for instance, about um, the funding of electoral administration in, in the United States and how um, areas which typically are low participation, which may have racial issues and, and so on and so forth, tend to be underfunded and that this goes on and compounds ultimately um, inequalities. <coughs> Cottrell and colleagues, for instance, going on to, to point to the fact that the resource allocation is ultimately indicative of the underlying fairness of the electoral process and the extent to which all voters are treated equally under the law. So equality, I think, an important perspective to see <coughs> questions of electoral administration and the like through. Okay, um, now we can link this to broader discussions, and I think this is important to link these to broader discussions as well. And it's important not just to see the electoral process as one process alone. Of course, we should analyze it as we're doing at this conference at that level, but it also links into other processes, links into discussions about social equity and, and need in public services. And we can actually draw from those for what we expect to be, be happening. <coughs> in other words, if we hope that um, electoral integrity um, is being enhanced by the spending on electoral administration, we should actually expect to see higher electoral administration spending in areas of higher inequalities. Um, Guy Goodwin-Gill in his um, account of um, electoral administration, electoral um, integrity in 2006, um, putting it thus, as you, you see in the screen, um, the deeper systemic problems presented by the fact that minority and other groups in society are still commonly under or unrepresented, requiring positive action on the part of government if the result required by the principle, ultimately equality, is to be attained. Persistent inequalities, um, certainly in Britain we have young people, um, black and ethnic minority populations, um, deprived or less well-off populations, um, and of course, turnout can be something that, that compounds itself over um, elections as, as well. Low turnout areas tend to be low, low turnout areas regardless of the election. So a number of hypotheses um, then to, to take us off. Um, less well-off constituencies demonstrating high levels of election administrative spending. Um, <coughs> constituencies with higher proportions of ethnic minority voters demonstrating higher levels of EA spending. 
um, constituencies with higher proportions of young voters demonstrating higher levels of election spending, and then constituencies with lower turnout demonstrating higher levels of spending. Um, I'm going to rattle through this because I, I dare say I'm going to start getting the, 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 the speed up flag at some point um, shortly. The data that I'm using here comes from um, returning officers spending returns for the 2015 general election, measured importantly at the constituency level. And this allows integration with constituency level electoral data from the British election study and from the 2011 um, census. The, the um, dependent variable is the total maximum recoverable amount per constituency and the total amount per elector per constituency. This is the amount that the government permits to be spent on each constituency for electoral administration. One thing we can say is that elections in Britain are becoming more expensive and they're becoming more expensive um, beyond inflation. This is not just an increase at the rate of inflation. There's more going on here. And what we see is that there are actually um, ultimately regional variations in election spending. Um, this is by the, the regions in the, the UK. Um, what we see is, where are we? Scotland, mid table there. Um, spending per region 190,000. Um, whereas if you go to the East Midlands at the top, um, spending just under 95,000. Um, big variations in the amount being spent regionally on election administration. Um, and that um, is, is there a couple of columns along by elector as well. Scotland spending just short of three pounds per elector. Um, but the East Midlands um, 1.29. So big variations in spending in this regard. Um, looking at bivariate analyses of these with, um, with some of the <coughs> excuse me inequality measures. Um, our census has a measure of deprivation across four different different measures. Um, and with most of these at bivariate level, it's a, it's a positive relationship um, and statistically significant. And with the, the black and ethnic minority population, um, likewise. But what we're interested in ultimately is a multivariate analysis. Um, now, quite simple OLS regressions are what have been done here. Um, two groups of controls alongside the, the inequalities variables. This is based on the, the, the little that there is analytically on um, these, these sorts of um, cost questions. First Mr. of all, you have two minutes left. Great, thanks, okay. Daniela. Um, production costs, the amount of postal votes, polling stations, combined elections. In other words, the things that, that have to happen to produce the elections and uh, also various political institutional things. Um, Okay, um, run very quickly through the, the findings rather than, than show you necessarily a, a, a table. Um, with, with MRA total, the amount that the government allowed to be spend, spent per constituency, only the proportion of black and ethnic minority um, in, in people in the population um, is in the expected direction and statistically significant. What is more important ultimately are those production cost variables. The provision of polling stations, funding postal votes, and um, both are positive relationships, statistically significant, um, combined elections the other way, negative relationship and statistically significant. Those regional differences all still come through, except for a couple, um, Wales, Northeast and the, the Southwest. MRA, looking at this by elector, rather than just the, the total being spent in the constituency. It's largely the same outcome. Um, so it largely confirms the, the findings. Okay, um, to conclude, extra funding ultimately for inequalities doesn't really seem to be part of uh, election administrative spending. With the caveat that, that obviously black and ethnic minority populations do seem to have had some extra spending on them. My argument ultimately is this is a missed opportunity, but what I'd like everyone here to, to really think about is the fact that there's, there's a need to focus on this capacity and conduct 
of electoral administration as one means of addressing hard to reach communities and, and funding is, is a key way in doing so. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Alistair. Um, great, so now we're gonna move on to our second presentation, which turns to Brazil. Uh, we have Eduardo Borges, um, who will be presenting about the Electoral Court of Brazil. So Eduardo, whenever you are ready, you can share your screen and begin. And uh, I'll, you have uh, 12 minutes and I'll get at two minutes, I'll just pop in to let you know. Professor, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I have not made a presentation PowerPoint, but uh, I have here uh, an organized presentation. It will not take more than 12 minutes, I'm sure. Well, um, first of all, this the paper that I submitted is part of my PhD research that is focused on false allegations of electoral fraud. It's something that we did not have here in Brazil. We have a solid history of elections since the democratization in 88. When this information appeared here in Brazil, it was focused on candidates and political parties at first. But at the second round of the presidential election in 2018, when Jair Bolsonaro reached to the second term, it appeared this information aimed not at candidates, nor at political parties, but at the electoral process itself. There were a lot of rumors, such as the electronic ballot box that has been used for more than 20 years would not allow auditing, that the superior electoral court had its system uh, in a cloud system that could be breached, that during the presidential election, there was a hacker attack. So there were a lot of false allegations that during the second round, the electoral process itself was uh, uh, had uh, it was victim of uh, frauds, and this type, this very specific type of disinformation, caught the Superior Electoral Court and the all bodies of the electoral justice short-handed. So during the second round of presidential elections, the Superior Court had to improvise uh, ways of counter countering all this disinformation. So from, to, from 2018 to nowadays, we can see that the electoral justice have, has been developing uh, a way to counter all this disinformation in three separate fronts. We could see an informational front that is aimed at producing uh, true information that is targeted also in educating the citizenship and also the servants of the electoral justice and controlling inadequate behavior. So th there is this first front that is aimed at information itself. And from 2018 to nowadays, we can see that the electoral justice has been developing a program building on its expertise acquired in 2018. So there is now a permanent program of countering disinformation that is targeted at the electoral process itself. It's, uh, uh, there is a document with a lot of access, a lot of uh, goals, and they also have been rendering their, their results. There's this re uh, uh, compilation of what has been made in 2020 and what will be done in 2022 when the disinformation has been spreading again. There is the second front that is the procedural one. Here, the electoral justice for at least 15 years has been conducting a lot of public 
safety tests with the electronic box, the electronic ballot box. You can submit a plan of attack to see if the electronic ballot box is safe or not. And there is also an internal procedure process, process that can also uh, that is also aimed at seeing if there is any flaw in the internal or external components of the electronic ballot box. So there is this procedural front that is aimed at uh, checking if there is any flaw in the electronic box, but in the context of the disinformation targeted at the, the electoral process itself, it is not only on the purpose of uh, perfecting the electronic ballot box, but it's also increasing transparency of the, the electoral system. And at, at last, there is this sanctional front that is a lot more controversial because the electoral superior court in 2020 faced a lot of attacks from the president elected. And in response, when the tension had reached its peak, the Superior Electoral Court received a process that questioned a uh, uh, state representative that in the day of the election made a live in his Facebook saying that he had received proof that the electronic ballot box was frauded, that it would not receive votes for one of the candidates for presidency. And the Superior Electoral Court said that it was not allowed to make such uh, claims. And because of this, it revoked the representative's mandate and declared him ineligible for eight years. Apart from this process, there were there are a lot there are also two investigations that has been that have been conducted by the, the Superior Electoral Court. The first is uh, has a purpose of collecting all the alleged reports of fraud, reports of alleged fraud, in the pretext of seeing if the, if any of those reports they check. But what is at stake, it's actually the image of electoral justice. And there is also another investigation had, had that both, them, both of them, they happen in secrecy, they are top secret. And the second one is targeted at seeing if all these allegations, they would consist on a electoral or on a criminal illicit. And because of this, it could also lead to mandates being revoked and ineligibilities being declared. And in the second investigation, the electoral justice, they uh, ordered the social platforms such as YouTube, Twitch, Instagram to stop uh, monetizing all the lives that reported allegations of fraud, to stop sending the money to those that made all these videos and also to stop using algorithms that would lead the, the internet users to another video of the same content. So there's this decision and in the, in the, last, the, the last action on the sanctional front, the Superior Electoral Court in a resolution of its, uh, a non-resolution because it has a prerogative of editing uh, laws, so as to so to speak, it said that spreading false allegations of electoral fraud can be uh, an, a criminal felony and also an electoral felony. But there is no, uh, there is not in any of law that could uh, authorize the electoral superior court to say so. But it actually did. So what I can say from this, these actions that the superior electoral court has been. Uh, developing uh, different tactics to counter all the false allegations of fraud, building in, in, in its own expertise to one, target information of the electoral, the electorate, but also to 
sanctionate all the political actors that are spreading this, this, this information. I guess that would be the, the resume of my presentation. Thanks very much, Eduardo. Um, great, so we, and, and you're under time, thank you. So we'll move on now to the third panelist, which is Emre Toros uh, from Hachetep uh, University. And he'll be presenting uh, about, uh, regarding the 2019 Istanbul local elections. So when you're ready, uh, Emre, you can go ahead uh, and share your screen if you have a presentation. Thank you very much, Daniela. May I use the extra time here or just we'll just save it for the discussion? Let's save it for the discussion if possible. <laughs> I'm just joking. Thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, that's, I believe you can see my screen now. Perfect. Yes, yes. So um, and this is a uh, presentation on, uh, uh, this is an evaluation of the repeat elections in Turkey, which happened in 2019. Uh, this is this was a local election, but uh, for the ones who are not very familiar with the Turkish society and the Turkish electoral scene or political scene, um, these uh, local elections were quite important back then. Uh, they are still important because uh, it created a lot of hustle within the um, country during that time. But uh, for our purposes, I will just summarize first uh, what was the case and how I analyzed it in the uh, through the lenses of uh, electoral integrity. So um, this is what happened basically. Um, in 2019, in March, we had the first round and you usually have the first round, you don't have any second round for the uh, local elections. Um, this is um, a winner takes it all type of election. So who will win the election? It's not a proportional type of election. So. Uh, in the first uh, instance, uh, there were two big um, uh, candidates who were running for the mayorship. And the first one, as you can see, Ekrem Imamoglu, uh, got the 48.79% of the votes. And it, he was the um, candidate of the opposition. Uh, and Binel Yildirim, who was the former prime minister, last prime minister of Turkey before the regime change, was running for the um, the incumbent AKP um, because Istanbul is the biggest city in Turkey and because it has the most resources, it is a kind of a, um, a general election rather than a local election. So as you can see, it's a kind of a very very narrow gap between these two candidates, and then um, two uh, uh, various mechanisms, I would say. Uh, being most of them being very funny, uh, AKP filed the um, a lot of cases on YSK. YSK is the e electoral management body in Turkey, the highest electoral body in Turkey, uh, which uh, has the um, right to annul or uh, ratify the elections at the end of the day. So um, AKP, uh, since uh, they have very close ties to the members with the members of the YSK. Uh, in some way, I'll just skip the details. If there were any questions, I'll tell you the details about this. But most of the time, it's just kind of made of allegations, lots of them. And the uh, at the first instance, the in some districts, the votes were recounted. And then the gap, this narrow gap was actually not widened, just the opposite, it got narrower. So then AKP filed another case to the YSK uh, and made up some, some allegations which were quite um, lacking ground. And then uh, YSK actually decided to repeat the elections. That was kind of a very uh, surprising at the moment in the Turkish political history because we didn't face anything like that before. Um, but after the repeat elections, you will see on the right-hand side of this slide, the repeat election formed that gap. It's nearly 10%. So the, the result of the uh, EMB decision in Turkey actually uh, did not work as the incumbent party intended to. So the narrow gap was widened. So my question was, the puzzle was, why? what was that reason for behind that? 
So how did it become, well, how did this narrow gap became that much bigger, 10 times bigger? So um, uh, for the sake of being simple, I will just skip the literature review quite fast and we'll try to show you the data about this because this uh, study is kind of, I think, original because it used some kind of um, um, some um, uh, innovative tools, I would say, which were not used in the electoral integrity scene beforehand. Uh, we all know what is electoral integrity and what we are looking for in elections. But um, in recent time, um, some studies actually turned back into the electoral management. So they, they started to lots of um, uh, authors tried to, uh, to uh, investigate how this electoral management bodies are working, what are the, the resources, as I was just, just presented. Um, and actually, the only thing about here is that um, we are looking for legitimate elections. The only base ground for that is that the, the electoral management bodies in countries are kind of responsible for providing the base for legitimate elections. Um, and also we know that there is another line of literature that argues, uh, that argue that um, uh, malpractice or um, um, uh, fraud, whatever you may call it, uh, may cause uh, in uh, different directions like, but at the end of the day, it will kind of decrease the public trust and confidence in the voting process. That's the biggest danger, which I'll just argue that it caused a vote alteration. Um, so we also know that there are lots of country studies focusing on the uh, electoral management. And then we have some cross-national studies which try to understand the politics of electoral administration and the, for example, the, there are lots of studies thinking about that EMB independence, focusing on EMB independence, structure, composition, and function of the electoral management bodies in different countries, basically in uh, the, uh, most of them are actually in, in Africa, but we also have different examples throughout the world. So, uh, what I argue is that the YSK, the biggest uh, electoral management body in Turkey, the highest one authority decision damaged the credibility of the elections, hence created a legitimacy problem, resulting in alteration in the vote choice. That's a kind of a stretch. I know that, and I really want to hear your comments about that, but I'll turn back to this uh, vote alteration in a moment. So uh, I have two research questions for this paper. How did the voters evaluate the YSK's decision? And then how did the AKP supporters evaluate the YSK's decision? AKP, remember that this is the incumbent party which is ruling Turkey for nearly 25 years now. And um, they have the mayorship of uh, Istanbul at the same time for nearly 25, 30 years or even more. So we had, uh, we, between these March and uh, June, we had the opportunity to field a study in Istanbul, a representative, Istanbul representative face-to-face -face survey. And we uh, made it uh, in 37 districts of Istanbul. Um, these are all um, actually named constituencies at the same time. These districts also, uh, let alone this uh, the greater municipality of Istanbul, they are choosing their own mayors, these, these districts as well. Um, we have direct questions on um, the common uh, questions that we see in the literature, like the uh, World Value Service, Battery on Electoral Integrity, Electoral Integrity Project, of course, fairness and rightfulness of uh, YSK's decision, then factors that damage the credibility of the last elections. So um, the, the fun part of this uh, for me was including a list experiment. Uh, a list experiment for those who are not very familiar with is a kind of a tool that eliminates the social desirability effect or aims to eliminate the social desirability effect. Um, rather than asking the question directly, you just use the tool and then uh, you try to make some calculations about that. There are lots of examples, especially for the voting behavior, which use that list experiment. Uh, we have used that with Sarah, Sarah Birch um, in another study and actually it was quite useful. That's why I just you know, repeat that tool in this spec special uh, elections. So these are some very basic descriptive statistics about in general how people see um, elections free and fair and how they evaluate March elections, the ones 
the one that is repeated. Actually, you can say it's a kind of a binomial distribution. It's just on one side, we have the ones completely free and fair, and then on the other side, not free and fair at all. This is the, this is the scene that we see nearly for every single uh, issue in politics in Turkey at the moment, which is not very surprising to see for that particular one. So we asked direct questions about was the YSK's decision right? As you can see, we see that the completely wrong part is kind of nearly 50%. So this just, you know, lits the light. And then when you ask the question, it, was it that fair? Again, 50% of the voters or the sample think that this, is, this was not fair. But still, we still have 30% of voters who thought that this is totally fair. And then we also ask, this is important, I believe, if this is another theme uh, for this uh, two-sided um, structure in Turkey, polarized, you would say, perhaps. Um, uh, we ask the, the respondents about how did they feel about YSK's decision. And on the left-hand side, these are for the feelings of all voters. And on the right-hand side, it's only for the AKP, the incumbent voters. As you can see, AKP voters uh, felt hope and pleasure for this uh, decision and um, they did not feel anxiety or they did not feel any anger to government uh, but they feel to anger to opposition and so on and so but remember this is a direct question Emre, and you this, have you have two minutes thank you mm -hmm. uh, this is again direct question about did uh, YSK's decision damage the credibility of elections and actually you can see that nearly 65 percent of the voters said that yes so uh, we know that uh, the AKP's top vote was around 50% throughout these years. So this is an excess here, more than 15%. And this is the distribution, very simple um, table about, which I think this part is quite important. As you can see, uh, who voted in March for the incumbent AKP thought that 35% of them thought that the uh, YSK's decision damaged the credibility of the election. So I'll just uh, very fast uh, talk about the list experiment. I'll just share the details with anyone if they want to, per, uh, of course. Um, this is, uh, you have two groups, control and a treatment group, but in the treatment group, you have this indirect and sensitive item that called, uh, I asked uh, the, um, which factors actually damage the credibility of the elections. And these are three uh, other issues. And this one, the sensitive item. As you can see in the treatment group and in the control group, the mean, you calculate the mean and you see the, if there's a difference or not. And there we see a significant difference between treatment and control group. That means that uh, the AKP voters at the same time think that um, they, uh, the, the YSP's decision um, damaged the credibility of elections. And this is the last slide. I'll have some more, but you know, I'll just quit for now. Um, which is, this is the, I think, the summary of the whole uh, research. You see um, a, a plot, a graphic here, which plots two different models, which uh, first one is uh, done with the experiment, uh, the list experiment result, and the other one used the direct question of credibility in the logit regression. I'll just want you to focus on this part. As you can see, when asked directly, AKP voters said that no, actually YSK's decision did not damage the credibility of the elections. And then, but when you use the list experiment, when you ask them indirectly, it just reversed and they think that it has created the, the, it, uh, the YSK's decision to damage the credibility of elections. Um, to sum up, there are two different approaches here. So this is a stretch again, I know, but this vote difference, this 10 times vote difference actually created uh, was created with the decision of the AKP voters. And there is a line of literature arguing that if there is a kind of a fraud or malpractice, whatever you call it, um, the incumbent party voters are amongst the first ones who will change their votes rather than the other ones, because they all know that they will not change the votes in any case if there's a fraud or not. So I'll just... Um, just three more words about this. So what will we do for further work on this? What will be the future? Uh, what is the um, uh, relevancy of this uh, for future work is that um, I think for the Turkish case, we have a secrecy of elections. 
this is only what we have at the moment left for our democracy. So I think this is the last castle that should be protected and everyone thinks like that or the majority of the people thinks like that. So if there's a kind of a manipulation around election and if it's clear, it's very clear, then we see that um, if the legitimacy is kind of, you know, uh, fades away, that will be a problem for the incumbent and the other parties as well. So I think elections constitute as a no-touch threshold for democratic backsliding. And then um, in this case, I think it, it became, that's why I call this serendipity, because uh, it, it, it's kind of contributed to the uh, reversal of backsliding of democratic uh, problems in Turkey. I'll just stop here. Thank you very much for the extended time. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Emre. Um... Okay, we're going to move now to Karen Siebold uh, from uh, University of Arkansas, who will be presenting, now returning to the United States, she'll be presenting about the FEC in the U.S. Yes, thank you. I will be discussing the issues that is plaguing the Federal Election Commission. Um, that is the primary agency that oversees the campaign finance system in the United States. And as it was brought up in the Election Integrity Global Report, um, from Holly Ann on Monday that uh, campaign finance is still a major concern for election experts. Um, they consider the issues um, related to public funding, the influence of wealthy donors, transparency, and the public reporting of this data. So these are still big issues around the world and certainly in the U.S. as well. We were starting to build some trust in the U.S. campaign finance system over the years, or at least among the experts, but that appears to drop off in the 2020 election cycle, which is also the same election cycle where we see the largest spending in U.S. elections. The total cost of the 2020 cycle uh, came in over $14 billion. So um, there are concerns about campaign finance in the U.S. related to the amount that's being spent, but also there are other issues that um, are kind of, uh, of concern for the campaign finance system and are likely leading to some of this electoral backsliding that we're talking about. Um, over the years, the system has been loosened by the Supreme Court in a number of decisions that have really removed the uh, restrictions, the strict restrictions on fundraising and spending for political committees and nonprofit groups. And these groups engage in what we call independent expenditures, um, which is basically money spent um, on the election, but that's not coordinated with a political party or a candidate. Um, the Supreme Court has also weakened a lot of the rules that uh, guard the political parties and the electoral candidates, too. Um, the rules have been loosened are, and are very gray and somewhat easy to break. Uh, most of these political committees and nonprofit groups, though, that are um, out there and that the rules have been loosened over, um, most of them are funded by corporations, labor unions, and well-funded ideological groups. And over the years, these groups have really had outsized influence on elections in the U.S., um, the increased presence of these groups likely decreases the trust in the system among experts and the public, and again is leading to some of that backsliding. Uh, worsening the perception of election integrity in the U.S. is the debilitation of the FEC by the institutions of the U.S. government, and that's what I'll focus on today. Um, the FEC is the primary agency, again, that oversees the campaign finance system and enforces the rules. And um, to kind of steal the phrase from Christian Snot on Monday, they're being attacked from within. The Supreme Court, as I mentioned, um, not only have they loosened the laws over those different groups that spend money in the election process, but they've also removed a lot of the autonomy from the FEC in regards to making their decisions and who they're going to regulate or who they're not going to regulate. Um, they've removed a lot of their authority in various cases over the last couple of decades. Um, the Congress has also failed to source the agency adequately. And as we've seen from a number of these presentations, um, finances, resources, capacity is really important for the enforcement of election um, laws and election administration. But the president is also at fault in the United States. He has failed to appoint commissioners in a timely manner, which has uh, made it to where the FEC cannot even proceed with most agency business at times, um, or it ends up leaving the, uh, the, the, the commission politically imbalanced because there's a number of commissioners that stay well past their time to make up for these gaps in appointments. 
So for the purpose of my presentation, I'll focus on the failure to replace these commissioners in a timely manner and present my preliminary analysis. Um, full disclosure, though, I am working on a book on the FEC that really looks at all of these elements that have debilitated the agency and the results of that on their decision making. Um, just kind of a brief, some brief information about the FEC. It is led by a panel of six partisan commissioners who are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. However, no more than three may represent one party, but there is no law requiring that each party get three representatives. In the U.S., there are two major parties, the Democrats, Republicans, and each of those have representatives on this commission. Um, for the commission to proceed with business and to make decisions, four of those six commissioners have to be present. So when the president fails to appoint those commissioners in a timely manner, the, commissioners le uh, the commission panel is left without commissioners and they can't proceed, which is really convenient for the politicians who might benefit from that. Maintaining four commissioners, as I've been saying, has been a reoccurring problem. There have been a number of early exits. People leave because they're frustrated with the commission, um, the political gridlock on the commission, or they receive better jobs. And again, untimely appointments, which have left the agency unable to conduct business. Um, this leads to, again, many commissioners that will stay on well past their one six-year term, and then we get this political imbalance, and that starts to become problematic when you're wanting to reach bipartisan decisions on campaign finance. Um, to illustrate the impact of these empty seats and this political imbalance, I really organize um, the commissioner panel into various sets of commissioners, or what I'll call commissioner sets, um, as different commissioners enter or exit um, the commissioner panel um, that forms a new commissioner set. And this allows me to kind of look at these unique composition of commissioners um, and how they're politically balanced, how they're, uh, how many seats they have and how that might affect the decisions coming out of each of these commissioner sets. Um, and I did correlate the commissioner sets with the number of days in each set with the number of decisions. So um, they actually correlate pretty well in terms of the variation in days it tends to correlate with about the same number of decisions. Um, a couple takeaways from this chart of 14 commissioners. Um, I created this chart over the course of uh, a 20 year period from 2002 to 2020. Um, so there's 14 different sets of commissioners. A couple things to take away from this is there are three periods of time, three commissioner sets where there are only three commissioners present, so they're unable to do business. Uh, most of the time they hover around four or five of six commissioners, so they have just enough commissioners present. However, when commissioners recuse themselves, which they often do, um, this also leaves the commission unable to conduct business or make decisions. The second takeaway from this chart is the partisan Karen, balance. Karen, I'm not sure there's a, there's a chart being shown. Your screen's not being shared. I wasn't okay. sure earlier on in the presentation. Oh, Sorry. no. Okay. <laughs> no worries. I'll try again. Thank you. How about now? Do you see this chart? That's much better. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. That's really uh, the first step was just filler uh, or background. <laughs> so on this chart, you can see there's 14 different sets of commissioners I created over the last kind of 18 year period. Um, and it just kind of illustrates that there's a few periods where there are only three commissioners present. Commissioners can't make decisions. It also illustrates the political balance. Um, we're striving for a bipartisan commission since they are partisan um, and they're making decisions over campaign finance over each other's parties. So we're striving for partisan balance. That doesn't happen most of the time. There's only a few commissioner sets where neither party holds the highest number of seats. There's one set where the Democrats hold the most number of seats that only lasts for about 2% of the period of time compared to the Republicans who hold the highest number of seats, a number of sets, and, and that's uh, an, an inordinate amount of time. So um, let me see if I can get back into slideshow mode real quick. I'm not sure if that's what threw it off or not. Um, so just real quickly, I'm looking at how do empty seats, partisan imbalance affect the agency's ability to function and their ability to achieve consensus, which subject matters seem to kind of uh, block consensus among the commissioners, what types of decisions also make it difficult for them to achieve consensus. Again, looking at an 18 year period of time, I'm looking at their decisions on what we will call matters under review, which are essentially cases. 
Um, that's around almost 2,000 unique uh, cases I'm looking at, almost 4,000 decisions that were made on those cases, almost 20,000 commissioner votes. I'm just looking at some preliminary analysis of this data. And what I'm seeing right now is that um, kind of taking out the sets that could not meet because they couldn't make decisions, the 11 sets that are left, over the time, we can see that the rate of successful decision making where commissioners are agreeing, uh, four commissioners or more are agreeing to a decision, um, what we'll call successful decisions, is waning over time as the rate of failed decisions where four commissioners cannot agree to the decision is increasing. I'm looking at the directions of votes, affirmative versus negative. The affirmative votes are, affirmative votes are dropping as uh, successful votes are dropping. Um, negative votes are rising as the rate of failure rises. Um, usually they're making decisions on whether or not to accept a conciliation agreement between the FEC and the alleged party. They're looking at accepting the legal advice and guidance from their own consultants at the FEC, or they're agreeing whether or not a violation has occurred or to dismiss a case. Most of their decisions can be collapsed into about five decisions. Um, just real Karen, quick. you have, sorry to interrupt, you have two no minutes. Mm -hmm. um, just quickly looking at correlation between number of seats filled and rate of successful decisions, the more commissioners that are present, the, there is going to be an increase in their rate of successful decisions. For every commissioner present, they're going to see a 10% increase in successful decisions. Looking at the number of Republicans present and how that leads to an increase in successful decisions, given the high rate of Republicans that sit on this commission, um, for every Republican commissioner present, we'll actually see an increase of 10% in successful decisions. That's why you've got to look at what they're agreeing to and what they're looking at. Um, so kind of looking at the cases, those can be collapsed into about four categories related to contributions, disclaimers, foreign nationals, and reporting. Um, and it appears foreign nationals appears to be the subject that they disagree the least on. Looking at the types of decisions they're making on those cases, those can be collapsed into about five categories, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, conciliation agreements, factual and legal analysis prepared by their own staff, uh, whether or not there's a reason to believe or no reason to believe a violation has occurred or to dismiss the case. And the things that they're disagreeing the least on is whether or not to accept their own FEC staff's FLAs and whether or not there's a reason to believe a, a violation has occurred. They're more likely to agree to just dismiss the case, um, which might correlate with why we see a, a rise in successful decisions as more Republicans sit on the commission. Republicans in the U.S. Um, actually don't necessarily believe in those regulations over campaign finance. So the failure to replace these commissioners in a timely manner has led to closures, partisan imbalance. Um, we're seeing some results at the FEC in their decision making related to those um, issues. Um, and these partisan differences are interesting to look at in terms of the decision making at the FEC. So I will continue to do that. Um, I'll, I will conduct more rigorous analysis of this data once I get past my kind of the descriptive book that's about to come out on the FEC. If you have any questions, please let me know. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, and last but not least, we have Nazar Boyko who will be talking about electoral bureaucrats in uh, Ukraine, Russia, Poland, and Georgia. So go ahead. Are you able to see it on the screen? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Azar Boyko. I'm from Ukraine, Leave City. And uh, it's a great honor, as well as a relief uh, to participate today in the session and present uh, the part of my dissertational thesis. Uh, basically, I'm asking the question uh, about how authoritarian leaders control street level election administration. Uh, and at some point, I started to ask myself whether I could enlarge my approach of the control over election administration at the bottom level, a level over the authoritarian regimes to the mixed regimes and democratic regimes. And I started to figure out how to how to address this question empirically, but let me do it step by step. So in this audience, there is no need to explain how uh, important is street level election administration at the most numerous uh, level of election administration in the countries as well. There are challenges to recruit and mobilize enough poll workers in different conditions, especially it was obvious in the COVID times, uh, also uh, street level election uh, commissioners are the frontliners who are 
managing the elections with the voters, they are assisting the voters, they are issuing the ballots, counting the ballots. In some cases, they are addressing the, um, uh, the establishing of the voting results at the precincts. Uh, but also, uh, they are playing very important role in the mutual oversight of what is going on at the election precinct. And uh, just a second. Uh, yes, here. So, and uh, this mutual oversight, uh, if you if you would consider the classical scheme of the creation of uh, election commissions, that is uh, expert, partisan, and mixed, uh, this uh, mutual oversight is. Uh, more fully implemented in the partisan scheme of uh, election commission formation. And uh, the assumption of this uh, mutual oversight is based on the pretty straightforward, uh, straightforward and solid assumptions that when there is a poll work in the commission, uh, he lacks the opportunity to make uh, the fraud or some manipulations in favor of his candidate because he is being watched uh, by other colleagues in the commissions if there is a full and total political balance in the commission on the other hand uh, being deprived of the capacities to deliver extra votes to his candidate uh poll worker still has incentives to uh, watch other colleagues and as a result we have the situation when uh, under the uh, ideal level of mutual control we have integral and uh, elections without fraud and rigging this is an ideal case uh what uh what's interesting when we would ask uh, taking this assumption when we would ask uh, about the candidate strategies of reshaping uh street level election uh, administration and what factors uh, affect their decisions uh i come up with the uh, theory of uh, of of mutual uh, oversight and control uh, within recent election commissions by the candidates from the uh, side of the government and from the side of the opposition. But first, let's consider uh, the expectations and incentives the candidates have under the different conditions of the ideal control in the election commissions and uh, lack of this ideal control in the election commission. So when we have the high mutual oversight within the commission, the candidates have no uh, reasons to expect that their representatives, their poll workers, can deliver extra votes in their favor. As a result, consequently, these candidates do not strategically take the decision when they decide whether to reappoint their poll workers to the given commission, because it's kind of obvious if, they, if the poll workers cannot influence the results, there is no reason to input extra resources in figuring out which uh, poll workers to uh, to reappoint to the commission and which of them just dismiss. Uh, on the other hand, when we have the low uh, mutual control in the election commission, there are uh, strong expectations for the candidates to believe that their poll workers could deliver more votes. For instance, if the, if the candidate is represented by like more than the half of poll workers in the commission, he could have some expectations to his poll workers that they could deliver extra votes via rigging, via uh, cooking electoral protocols, so via ballot box stuffing, and we have a lot of this evidence uh, and results of systematic research from authoritarian regimes and consequently as a result some the candidate sides the candidates uh, have the incentives to be strategic and strategical when they are reshaping street level election administration so they look through the results at the polling stations and if they see that at the given polling station their representatives perform uh, in their favor so they have the incentive to we uh, reappoint these uh, poll workers to the same commission, expecting once again the better results in the future. So my hypothesis are driven from uh, from the previous explanations for the systems with a low level of mutual control uh, within election management bodies. I expect that the electoral support for the incumbent candidate positively affects the likelihood of the poll workers' reappointment, and uh, in contrary, uh, the electoral support for the oppositional candidate. Should negatively affect the likelihood of poll workers uh, reappointment and for the systems with a high level of mutual control uh, within PECs, the electoral support for the incumbent candidate doesn't affect the likelihood of poll workers reappointment and in the case of the oppositional candidate uh, oppositional candidate we should not see any any effect in the first in in the second uh, cases uh, 
so uh, my sample and its justification, I decided to work with uh, four countries. My uh, basic countries that I started the, the research from was Russia as a third tier case. Also, I decided to, to choose Poland, uh, Georgia, and Ukraine. Uh, Poland is my representation of this uh, closer to the ideal uh, case democratic elections, and Georgia and Ukraine are those middle cases that are stand between the Russia and Poland. I assume that uh, considering the peculiar peculiarities of uh, street level election administration in Georgia and Ukraine, I put Georgia closer to Russia on the authoritarian democratic scale and Ukraine closer to Poland. And if there is a need in a more detailed clarification and justification of uh, why this choice, wa choice was made uh, uh, due to the countries, I will, I will address this uh, with great pleasure. Uh, and these countries had the uh, experience of being uh, under the influence of Soviet Union, Poland less, other countries more. They had the uh, common point of departure in their electoral uh, and democratic practices. Still, they have variations in where they got in these 30 years. So I think that these cases are justifiable and com comparative. Also, the data accessible, uh, uh, accessibility of the data was also a critical point because not all the countries uh, are very cooperative in providing this, this information. Uh, data sources, very briefly, I got in contact with a lot of uh, representatives from uh, central election management bodies in these countries. Some of the data was publicly accessible on their websites. Some of the data was provided directly by the central election commissions. Other data sets were provided by the territorial and district election commissions. Some control variables data I got from, uh, from other institutions. So it was kind of uh, hard work to get it all and put it all together. Uh, at this point, I would like to uh, thank you, EEP Project, for the generous support uh, in finances that allowed me to put all the data sets and um, make it make it possible to present today. Uh, so my variables, my independent, uh, my set of independent variables are the uh, level of support for the incumbent candidate as well as the level of rate of support for the oppositional candidate. My dependent variable was the change in the reappointment of the uh, PC managers in the commissions. For some countries, these are PEC heads, deputy heads and secretaries. Uh, but in case of uh, Poland, for example, they didn't have the secretaries. They still have head, uh, PEC head, and just deputy head. Uh, I included a set of controls that were accessible, not in all cases, but I'm still working on that. And uh, maybe in future, I will be able to present like more full, more full uh, models of the analysis. Uh, so results, my, uh, my, my, my analysis strategy was a twofold. At the first stage, I ran the set of t-tests to see the, whether there was a difference in the means uh, of the election results for the opposition and for government incumbent candidates at the precincts with the reappointment and dismissed PC managers. In this case, I will just briefly demonstrate it uh, in, the case of, uh, in the case of Russia. So we have the first table, we have Vladimir Putin and Pavel Gorginian, the first incumbent, the second oppositional candidate. And uh, at the precincts with the dismissed PSC heads, uh, Putin got support of 77.46%. And at the precincts with the reappointed PC heads, he got like more than 1% higher result. And the result was statistically significant. The same approach was applied uh, to all the set of PC managers, deputy heads, secretaries. And uh, the same approach was applied to all the countries. Nazar, to, you have two minutes. Yeah, just mm -hmm. in brief, I didn't find something special here. I was just uh, a little bit surprised to see the uh, great difference in case of Poland. I didn't expect to see that, for instance, incumbent Andrzej Duda would uh, get 43.5% at the precincts with dismissed PC heads and almost 50% at the the precincts with the reappointed PC heads. So for me, it was surprising and something to, to dig in uh, deeper in the future. Also, my second uh, level of analysis was to run the set of uh, logistics regression and multivariate analysis, inclu including some control variables. And uh, just in brief, in general, I found the support for my hypothesis in case of Russia and Poland. So the uh, chances for PC heads, deputy heads, and secretaries for reappointment uh, rise dramatically in case of Russia. The more Putin got at the precinct, 
the higher are the chances for the PC managers of being reappointed. Uh, in the contrary, when the oppositional candidate Pavel Grudinin performed better, the chances for the PC managers to be reappointed uh, dropped down. In case of Poland, we have uh, the direction of the, the relation pretty the same, but the substantive effect is minuscule. So I cannot say that there is a, a relationship between the performance of the incumbent and the positional candidate in democratic country and the uh, strategic reappointment of uh, PC managers in this country. But what I was surprised with the Georgia in Ukraine results. I found that in Ukraine, unexpectedly, the uh, the dependency between the, the relationship between the dependent and dependent variable was uh, much stronger than I expected. And uh, after the analysis, I should switch the Ukraine and Georgia by their places. But once again, that is something to dig deeper in case of these two countries. Uh, feel free, like if you would like to see all the analysis with, with all the tables and, uh, and regression uh, results, please feel free to contact me. I will happily send it, conclusions and perspectives. So findings that the consistent uh, at the extremes, as I told, um, more mark in the middle, Georgia, Ukraine. What I'm going to do next, uh, I would like to include more controls for Poland. Poland presidential elections was in 2020. There was a COVID issue. So I assume that the rate of the COVID could have influence on the changes of the PC manager. So it could be independent um, factor in this, uh, in this case. Also, I should uh, research more on, uh, on the issue of technical candidates in Ukraine. It could also uh, change the results in the, in, the, in the expected direction, I hope. And also, as far as the first intellectual commissions are collective management bodies, uh, I should check the coordination between the PC managers. At the previous analysis, I consider them as an independently um, responsible and accountable to their candidates. But if you consider this coordination hypothesis that they are uh, interrelated, head, deputy head, and secretary, uh, the analysis would be, I think, more deeper and more rigorous. Thank you very much and look forward to any of your comments.